Jesus' high priestly prayer concludes what is known as his farewell discourse with his apostles. Now we've spent this entire Lenten season looking at that farewell discourse, and I trust it has been very profitable to you. Uh, and we'll go back to shorter readings, uh, Lord willing, next week. Uh, but I wanted us to read through that entire discourse. He concludes it with what has been called his great high priestly prayer. Now, we, we have to ask the question, why would they call it, why, why would it become labeled a high priestly prayer? Well, if you think back to the Jewish economy and their temple worship, once a year, the priest would go uh, through the holy place into the holiest of holies, where the Shekinah glory resided, where the very presence of God was. And there he would bring uh, offerings for God's people. And so here we have Jesus now, our great high priest, uh, who has been, is able to be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He enters in not to an earthly sanctuary, which the Hebrew writer tells us is merely uh, a symbol of the one that's in heaven, he steps right into heaven, into the very presence of God, and he begins to intercede for his disciples. And so we find this great high priestly prayer. The prayer actually has the three sections to it. Uh, the first section, we find that Jesus opens by praying for himself. And what he says to the Father is, I've completed the work that you've given, given me to do, and now I want you to glorify me. Now, I want you to note, to note that the glory that he was looking forward to was not some kind of earthly honors. The glory that he was looking to was the cross. And he's asking God to glorify him. And the other thing, Leon Morris made this comment in his commentary. Jesus prays for his own glorification. Not as an end in itself, but as a means to the greater glory of the Father. Now I think that says something to us as people. In Matthew, the chapter 16, verse 15, is my life verse, which says, Let your light so shine, so that men will see your good works and glorify the Father in heaven. I'm beginning to see a pattern here that what we're to be doing, even though we're supposed to be good, and, and oftentimes people uh, will want to call attention to our works, our good works should point to the Father, not to something that is in ourselves. And Jesus gave us that model. He prays that God would glorify him, but that it would be done in such a way that the Father would receive glory. Next, and this is the largest body of the prayer, uh, Jesus prays for his disciples. He starts off by saying, uh, they, they believe that you sent me. And uh, that becomes kind of the basis then for the request. Uh, and he makes the point that they believe that you have sent me. And then the conclusion he draws from that is, uh, they're not of the world uh, any more than I'm of the world. But I'm going back to you and they must remain in the world. That brings us to the request. They're going to remain in the world. He discusses how that I protected them when I was here. I've got to go back to you. And so he simply requests the Father, will you protect them from the evil one? <clears throat> what a wonderful 
thing to have Jesus talking to us about. The older I get, the more I've become sensitive to evil influences around us. And as I, as I mature, I also see that uh, it's not just, uh, uh, you know, superstition that the devil is involved, but it becomes more and more apparent that the devil is behind a lot of things. Okay. And when Jesus makes it a point to pray for us and to protect us from the evil ones. Now he was praying particularly for the disciples at this point. They were going to go into a very hostile world. And of the 12 disciples that walked with him, only one lived to die a natural death. And that was the Apostle John, the one who wrote this book. Everybody, everyone else was either murdered or, in the case of Judas, committed suicide. They all died violent deaths. And so we understand Satan was trying to, to destroy it. And he asked them, he said, Father, I've got to go back. Now, will you protect them by your name? And he concludes this section by saying, look, I have, just as you sent me into the world, so I'm sending them into the world. He commissions them with a mission to go into the world and to get things done. Now, it would be easy to take a rabbit trail right here and expand on that and, and, uh, and do some things, but let's, uh, let's keep focused on the prayer because there's just a whole lot behind it that mission that he sent them on. The third section, he broadens that prayer. And he prays not simply for the 12 that uh, are around him, but he prays for all who will believe. I don't know about you, but for me, I find it very comforting that Jesus Long before even my daddy was born, Jesus was praying for me. So, you know? Uh, it, it is a wonderful, wonderful thought to know that he cares that much for us. And so he prays for all believers. Now, in this prayer, there are basically three things that happen. He's ending the prayer. He requests that they may be one as he and the Father are one. And then he asks for all believers that we would see him with the glory he had with the Father before he came into the world. Almost every funeral I talk about, this great hope that we have is that we are going to see Jesus. For us, sometimes it may not seem too much, but when we begin to realize that this one that we have loved, this one that we have served, this one that we have had a relationship by faith, he said, Father, I don't want them to just end up with a relationship that's by faith. I want them to see what they hope for. I want them to see the glory. We've talked about it. I want them to see it. Finally, he makes a promise that he will continue to reveal the Father to all of his disciples. Marvelous, marvelous prayer. Uh, in one sense, uh, it is a bit of a model for intercessory prayer. Uh, but uh, in the interest of time, uh, I want to move on to the real focus that I believe when he begins praying for us, the focus of that part of the prayer. And I'd like to spend the rest of our time discussing this idea that we 
would be one. That we would be in unity. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one, Father, just as you and I are one. Uh, when we begin talking about this idea of unity, one of the things we need to talk about is what unity is. And we, we can talk about, well, that's the number one. You know, there's one and things like that. But when we begin talking about people being unified, now we need to reflect on it just a little bit. So where, what do we got? Well, first of all, in the Bible, there are three institutions that demonstrate unity. The very first one we find is in Genesis 2.24, where uh, it says, Therefore, for this cause, a man will leave his father and mother, and they will become one flesh. Okay? Our marriage, we are supposed to be in unity. Second, there's the Trinity. At Jesus' baptism, we find Jesus coming up out of the water, the Holy Spirit coming, lighting on him like a dove, and the Father speaking from heaven saying, um, Oh, uh, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Okay? We get the Trinity. And finally, the church. And that's where our text is from. I want them uh, to be unified. So, what is unity? First of all, unity is not uniformity. You see, too often people want everyone to look alike. Um, probably one of those examples might be um, the Amish. You know, we all wear the same black hat, blue thing, black pants, suspenders and buttons, no zippers, and, and when you see them around, you say, ah, oh, they're Amish, you know? Well, that's fine, and for them, it works well for them. But the idea of being in unity does not mean we're all uniform. Uh, the truth is, is that our unity is to be lived out in diversity. We're different. I'm not like Bert. I'm not like Julie. They aren't like me. And so what we need to understand is that this unity has something to do with us being different but unified. Um, so let's talk about areas. You know, you talk to the world that, oh, the church isn't unified by a church on every corner. And, and, you know, you go through history and you have the Hundred Years' War and, and you got the Catholics against the Protestants. And blah, 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 blah. Uh, church isn't unified, whatever. Well, let's ask ourselves some questions here with this discussion of unity behind us. Is, is a common form of church government unity. Now, what that means is, is should we all be Presbyterians? Or should we all be Roman Catholic? You know, what if, is this what unity is all about? Well, first of all, we just need a, a quick primer on church government. There are basically four types of church government. There's the Roman Catholic form, which is a monarchy. There's the Episcopalian form, which is the United Methodist Church and different ones like that. It's an oligarchy where you have the bishop to rule. Um, then you have the third form, which is a Presbyterian form of government, which is a representative democracy. Oh, by the way, I want you to notice that the people who were framers of the Constitution, many, I think, if not most of them, were Presbyterians. And so in America, we have a representative form of government. And then, of course, there is the congregational form of government. That is pure democracy. Okay, those are four forms of government that we have. Um, but the problem is church government does not define unity. When we begin talking about unity, church government is, first of all, a choice by those who are governed. As I have reflected on this over the years, I have come to realize that as long as you, that, that church government is one of those things that God has placed under our choice and what we should do. And so what happens is, as long as it, the form of government is operated with integrity and people uh, choose to use it, God says, you govern yourself the way you choose to do. Okay? Um, uh, second of all, the government you get is dependent upon the level of maturity of the people. 
You get new Christians. You get a group of people, you know, you're winning a lot of new people to the Lord, and they smell like, uh, you know, they're still kind of tied up with worldliness and things like that. They need a very strong form of government that says, you can't do that. You don't do that. You do this. Because they're just immature Christians. But hopefully they begin to mature at some place where they begin to think for themselves and begin to set boundaries for themselves. They need less government, not more. Okay? So it's dependent upon those things. Um, and so when we begin to talk about church government, it has uh, far more to do with uh, uh, the fact that um, the, the uh, we, I missed a slide in there. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> Can't make these points hard. Back to unity. I was looking for something that wasn't there. When we begin talking about unity, the unity in those three forms has three things, or two things. The, the unity is not uniformity. Each party maintains its own personality. Okay? So Lucy and I may be, in, are supposed to be in unity. But I'm John. She's Lucy. Okay? Uh, uh, I, I drive my vehicle like J.U., who saw his chariot coming, drives fast and furiously. <laughs> Lucy won't pull out in front of everything unless it's clear between Durand and Chastain. <laughs> we have our own personalities. We have our own. That didn't go. But our unity, our unity is uh, we maintain our own personality. We talk about the the the, uh, the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and we talk about their three personalities in unity, right? And God knows when we get a church together, we've got a variety of personalities, and in fact, spiritual gifts demand that we have different uh, personalities and do different things. However, if you look at those three Things, the, the things that get it, the thing that holds those relationships together is agape love. Jesus said about Father, I love the Father, Father loved me, want him to love you, whatever, based on love. We start talking about marriage. Marriage is based on love. Heavenly uh, uh, Paul, right, it said, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church. Okay? It's based on love. And when we begin talking about the church and unity that's there, we are talking about it based on love. you got to love me. <laughs> Going the other way, i got to love you. <laughs> Have you ever been around people that Sometimes you love them, but you don't like them. <laughs> okay. So, when we begin talking about church government, we begin to realize that just because people, the Christians, the world over, have chosen to govern themselves and to handle their, uh, their situation uh, some of it's based locally, some of it's based on what they, whatever it is. That's not what defines church. That's not what defines unity. I want you to think about one thing, and it will it will help you understand it. If you go back to the Protestant Reformation, the thing that gave rise to the Protestant Reformation was the fact that the Roman Catholic Church was basically in charge of all the Christians, Western Europe and whatever, and the leadership became very corrupt. And it corrupted the entire church. Okay? Now, Catholics will tell you that, because history says, you know, all the Protestants began having their Reformation, and the Catholics stepped back and said, whoa, we got to do something about this. Okay? 
So we have to understand that it is not our government, our church government, that determines our unity. That's something that we choose and that we work with with integrity. Uh, the second question is, oh, you guys aren't unified because, uh, you know, you, you, uh, you can't, you know, you talk to different people, they've got different theologies, they've got different ways to go about it. Well, let's explore this. First of all, there are several systems of theology. Just a primer here. you got the Greek Orthodox theology, Roman Catholic, Protestant. Protestants get divided up into Calvinism and to Wesleyan Arminianism. Okay? All of those are systems of theology. I will tell you also that they are consistent within themselves. Now where they differ is that they begin, all theology begins with certain assumptions. And the assumptions are different. And you change the assumptions and you change the theology. Okay? So what we've got here is, can we all be agreed on, on this? Well, the Apostle Paul writing said this, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. What's that mean? Well, you don't have to tell your Roman Catholic brother that his theology stinks and his mama wears combat boots. <laughs> See, part of the problem is, is we feel that because we've had differences, we have the right to disrespect one another. And the answer is no. No. Paul said, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit until we can come to the unity of the faith. What's the problem here? Um, agreement requires to have perfect unity it requires basically the same knowledge and a, the same experience. Okay, that's what it takes to do it. And humans are not omniscient. One of the reasons why the Trinity is in, is in perfect unity is they know everything, right? They're omniscient, they've had the same experiences, they know all these things. So they're in complete unity. There's no area of disagreement. But as human beings, we're finite. We're limited. We're just little guys. We know so much. We know what we know. Furthermore, we have all had differences of experience. I was raised in a very strict, old line holiness way, okay? Others of you were raised in some rather liberal places, and our experiences growing up with Christianity, some of you were raised in a non-Christian home. Our experiences are are not the same how we came and so there's going to be areas where we just frankly can't see eye to eye just because of what we know and where we've been our agreement must be in the spirit until we can reach a general understanding that makes sense okay so when people say well you're not unified because you don't share the same theology the answer is uh, that's not what caused our unity. What is our unity? Jesus prayed, By this will all men know you're my disciples, if you love one another. Our unity is in our hearts, not our heads. How do you have a community church we're sitting in the same pews, people who come from a Baptist background, a Pentecostal background, a, a uh, hell holes and honky tonk background. <laughs> How do you have all of them sit in the same? Some of them are old. Some of them are young. Some of them like rock music, and others think that rock music came from hell. <laughs> Some of them think
think that the angels sing Southern Gospel. <laughs> Others said, swear up and down that Gabriel's harp is contemporary music. Okay? You see the point? Our unity is in our hearts, <coughs> not our heads. Amen. Amen. You've got to love one another. Jesus is praying. I want to be in you. Just like, how is that, Jesus? Well, it starts and says, I love them so much, I'll die for them. It starts and says, Pastor John loves his congregation so much, he'd die for them. And the congregation looks at the people they're sitting with in the pew, and they look at one another and say, I love you so much, I'd die for you. I'm going to do, I'm going to love you and do what's best for you, what I can possibly do. I'm going to tell you something, folks. When you get people that love one another like that, the world will look at that and say, now there's a bunch of Christians. Amen? And that's what Jesus prayed for. That's what Jesus prayed for. I'll be honest with you. I have another half hour worth of stuff in there to preach. But I'm going to have mercy on you. <laughs> oh. Now you know why I tell you I love you. I mean it. Do I get frustrated at times? Well, let me turn it back. Do you get frustrated? But frustration doesn't hinder love. Jesus said, Father, please. 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 Keep them unified. Let them love one another. That way the world will know that you sent me. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before you this, this morning, thanking you for the privilege of serving you. Sometimes we make things so complicated. And when we make it complicated, we miss your message to us. Will you be with us as a church? Lord God, you know we're not perfect. The truth of the matter is, sometimes we're even a little ugly. Father, I pray that the spirit of love would fill this congregation and that it would overflow and run out the windows and the doors, down the streets and in and out the businesses and in and out the homes. And may the love that you shared with us, may it be shared with a lost and a dying, a broken and a sinful world in such a way that people will know Jesus loves me. This I know, Father, that He would that they would be brought to you and to your church. And that, Father, we all may be unified. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. Take your hymnal. Sing 187, just a, a short chorus. I thought probably the best way to end this discourse is that He is Lord. <coughs> It's Palm Sunday. He was crowned king as he went in. And he prayed that we would be one. And I think it's good for us to sing back to him in response. He's Lord. Hymn number 187. <clears throat>